Uh, our next keynote speaker is uh, Peter Bartlett. It's an honor to have him today. Uh, he's a professor in the Division of Computer Science and the Department of Statistics at UC Berkeley and also Associate Director of the Simmons Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, he's the co-author of the book Learning in Neural Networks Theoretical Foundations. And it's also worth mentioning that Peter has many, uh, he was a very successful professor. He had many students that are now, now famous in the, in the world of machine learning. Uh, the title of his talk today is uh, some representation, optimization, and generalization properties of deep network. So let's have a round of applause for Peter Bartlett. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and uh, very happy to be here. This is uh, huge, much larger than I expected. So um, uh, I'm talking today about a few different uh, theoretical results about uh, deep networks in a few different directions. I like to think of uh, deep feed-forward networks as compositions of nonlinear functions. So uh, mappings that take us from one vector space to another, via a composition. So from, from uh, one vector, we map through a function h1 to another vector, through a function h2 to another vector, and so on. And uh, thinking abstractly about these functions, not in, uh, necessarily in a particular parameterized form, but of course, you know, typically they're things like uh, a component-wise nonlinearity applied to a linear function of the input vector, uh, where the component-wise nonlinearity might be a sigmoid function like this, if you're um, old-fashioned, or if you're modern, it might be a piecewise linear function, like the ramp function. Uh, and the parameters that enter here are the WIs. Um, but we'll actually be thinking of these HIs in, in this talk, uh, for, for much of this talk, as um, elements of a rather uh, generic family of, of uh, vector-valued functions on a vector space. OK, so this is a class of functions that we're, we're interested in, and of course, you know, these have, have been of, of huge interest lately um, for their practical successes. The, the intuition about that, uh, I guess, is that we're learning representations, that the depth here, the depth of this composition of functions is something that gives us an effective way of uh, representing useful features as we progress through this network. Uh, and it's a rich family of functions. If we think about uh, each layer computing some element of a non-parametric family, composing those layers of functions gives us a parsimonious way of representing very rich, very rich functions. Um, you know, the approximation theory tells us that nonlinear parameters are much more powerful. Uh, you know, we've known for a long time, for instance, that splines with free knots can do much more than, than linear parameterizations can do. And uh, if you're taking compositions of these uh, linearly parameterized functions, then um, uh, you, know, you would expect that to be uh, even more the case. Uh, and, and there are explicit results about particular functions that require much more complexity to have a shallow representation than a, than a deep one. Um, but those sorts of properties should raise some cause for concern from a theoretical perspective when we try to do optimization, so parameter estimation, cho choosing appropriate values of the parameters in networks of this sort, in, in deep compositions of this sort. Um, you know, we're certainly uh, faced with a non-convex optimization, a very non-linear parameterization, and we should expect things to get even more difficult as the, as the depth increases. Um, and also having the ability to represent in a parsimonious way very complex functions sh should give us uh, a reason to, to pause and worry about the statistical aspects. You know, th this means we have a very complex class of functions, perhaps that can be represented in a simple way, and so we should be concerned about the generalization properties of, of such a class of functions. Um, so, you know, a natural question there is what determines the statistical complexity uh, of a deep network? What determines whether we're going to be able to generalize from a training sample to the, the population? Okay, so those are the, the two broad topics of the talk today. I want to start focusing on deep residual networks, which are big interest, particularly in computer vision kind of applications. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at a few of the, the representation and optimization properties of these, of these networks um, and look at some recent results about uh, optimization in deep networks. And here we have to backpedal and work with uh, linearly parameterized networks. I'll say a little bit about that um, uh, when we get there. 
Uh, and the third part of the talk is going to be about statistical complexity of, of deep networks. OK, so let's start on deep residual networks. And for this audience, you know, I'll probably skip through this. This is um, maybe rather, rather redundant. The next few slides are shamelessly stolen from uh, Kai Minghe's uh, ICML tutorial a couple of years ago. So um, this was at the time or soon after the introduction of residual networks. And, and the plot here shows the bar graph is showing the uh, improvement in performance on a, a large-scale computer vision problem, uh, moving from right to left. Um, and the, the triangle dashed line there is, is showing the increase in depth of, of these, these networks. So residual networks are getting a much, um, working with much deeper networks uh, and, and getting some very significant improvements in, in performance on this benchmark task. Uh, and you know, there's a very nice graphical demonstration moving from AlexNet through um, VGG and GoogleNet to ResNet. You know, this is um, uh, very much deeper. Um, so what are residual networks? Think of two layers in a standard deep network where we're computing uh, a linearly parameterized uh, vector-valued function of an input vector x. Then we're taking some nonlinear function, let's say the ReLU, and then computing again a linear, linearly parameterized uh, vector-valued function of that, and again a nonlinearity. So that, this is the way two stacked layers work in a uh, a vanilla deep network, uh, the analogous thing in, an, in a residual network, at least the case that we're going to consider here, is where there's a shortcut identity connection. So the input and output directions, uh, uh, dimensions are the same. We're thinking of these as uh, uh, vector-valued mappings from RD to RD. And, and the mapping is the sum of the identity plus some other nonlinear function. In this case, it's a uh, linear combination of these um, ReLU functions of, of uh, again, a linear function. Okay, so um, that's the difference between a standard network and a residual network. Um, uh, and so one way to think of this is, uh, you know, think of these compositions now. Each of the HIs is an identity function plus two layers of a, of a network. All right, so we might think of it as x uh, mapping from a vector x to x plus this uh, rather general um, a function from a rather general family of functions. OK, so why residual networks? So why, why this particular parameterization? So if you start with zero-valued parameters or you know, rather small random initializations, then you're computing something that's the identity or, or rather close to the identity. And that's good from the perspective of feedback. Right? So those identity connections are giving us useful feedback throughout the network. Uh, you know, think about what happens if you want to pass a gradient with respect to some loss function back to a parameter deep in a 100-layer in a network of this kind, um, having near identity functions all the way back gives us something that's very well conditioned even early in the network. Uh, and, and this intuition is borne out with experimental results. So, so this is a plot of performance on a, a particular image classification task. Uh, on the left is a, a standard deep network with varying number of layers showing the, the dashed line is the training performance uh, on, a, as training proceeds uh, with a a standard stochastic gradient kind of approach. And you see that um, uh, as the depth of the network increases, the, uh, the value that this optimization method, the, the um, parameters that this optimization method finds are not as good in, in terms of training error. And the solid lines are a test error. And again, it's borne out that they're, they're not as good for the, for the deeper networks. Of course, that's a failure of optimization, because you know, the, the deeper network can represent anything that the shallow network can represent because we have relus, we could stay in the linear part of the nonlinearity, for instance. Um, on the right is, uh, in, in contrast, the ResNet, and you can see both on train and test uh, an improvement in performance as the depth increases. Um, so we seem to be avoiding that that failure of the optimization method with uh, with the ResNet, and you know these things have, have led to uh, huge improvements on a bunch of benchmark benchmark tasks in uh, in computer vision. Okay, um, 
So I want to talk a little bit about some representation optimization properties of these networks. The, the, there's been a bunch of um, related work. Most closely related is uh, some work by uh, Moritz Hart and Tengu Ma, which was the starting point for our work. I'll, I'll go into a bit of detail about that in a moment. But there's been a whole lot of other work looking at the uh, uh, properties of optimization landscapes for, for uh, parameterized classes of, of this kind. Um, perhaps the most closely related there is this work on ResNets of uh, Ohad Shamir, which showed that if you have uh, a linear um, function uh, composed with something that a, a ResNet or something of that sort can compute, then in some sense you don't lose anything by introducing the ResNet um, in, in that earlier stage. Uh, uh, so let's talk about the Hart and Ma results. There, there are two results that are that are kind of relevant here. So they, they investigated the, the linear case. So you know, we have a deep composition of linear functions, kind of crazy way to represent a linear function, right? because you're not changing anything. You still have a linear function. But if we think of that deep composition uh, and, and uh, think of parameterizing a linear function in this, in this funnier way, um, uh, mostly because linear functions are easier to analyze. You know, I think that's the big motivation for thinking about this sort of a, uh, a parameterization. Um, it's a step towards understanding uh, deep residual networks. Uh, so, so their result was that if you have uh, a linear function, you think of it as a matrix A, uh, and um, you'd like to represent it as a composition of linear functions, so product of matrices, then you can do that in a way that keeps all of the matrices in that, in that composition, all these linear functions close to the identity. Um, and they can be closer and closer to the identity as the depth increases. Right? So, so um, you know, at a high level, this is saying that depth means that you don't lose anything by staying close to the identity. OK, and the, the second uh, result that they had, again, for, for linear uh, deep linear compositions, um, is if you have uh, a linear Gaussian model, so the relationship between x, y pairs is linear. There's this matrix A, and uh, it gives you the conditional expectation of the, the vector y given x, uh, and there's additive Gaussian noise. And you're trying to, uh, in some sense, estimate A, so you're trying to choose a product of matrices um, that we've represented here, parameterized here as identity plus something, a product of those matrices as our best guess of the prediction of y given x. Uh, so we want, what we're aiming to do is minimize the expected squared Euclidean norm of our prediction error here. So we're in, we're in this setup of, of uh, minimizing this squared Euclidean distance. Then it turns out that a first order um, uh, condition implies a, a, a global, we're at a global optimum. So provided that all of these um, uh, factors in the product are close to the identity, so we have identity plus something with a small spectral norm, um, then every stationary point of that quadratic criterion is a global optimum. Right? So uh, you know, we don't need to, to consider anything but this first order condition that if we're at a stationary point, then the product of those matrices is necessarily the um, uh, the right thing. OK, and so first result says that, that uh, considering uh, products of things that are close to the identity is, uh, um, is quite, a general, quite a general family of functions, uh, of linear functions. Uh, and the second result is that if we can um, uh, stay close to the identity uh, everywhere through our, through our composition, then every stationary point is a global optimum of this uh, least squares criterion. OK, so the, the first part of the talk is uh, about generalizing those results to the nonlinear case, uh, compositions of, of nonlinear near identity functions. Uh, this is joint work with Steve Evans, who's in statistics and mathematics at Berkeley, and Phil Long, uh, who's at Google. Um, so the analog of the first result is that if we have, uh, so, you know, generalization of the determinant being non zero for the linear case, if we have a smooth invertible map, uh, then we can spread the computation of that map. So this is from RD to RD. We can spread the computation of that map through uh, a composition of M functions and represent it exactly. And the functions that we have there, those vector-valued functions, are all 
uh, can all be close to the identity. Close in the sense of this norm is a, it's actually Lipschitz semi-norm, so, so the difference between that function and the identity is something that's you know, really rather flat. Right? Think of it as having a small, small slope. Um, and as the depth increases, we can have these, these functions in our deep composition getting closer and closer to the identity. All right, so in, in the sense of, you know, if we're willing to restrict ourselves to these smooth invertible maps, then being close to the identity is no, is no restriction. Being close to the identity at every, um, uh, for, for every one of these functions in our composition is no restriction. Okay. Um, so we can think about the, the functions as being the identity plus some other, you know, approximation to a, a sort of rather arbitrary vector-valued function. Maybe it's a... Um, AI times some uh, non-polynomial nonlinearity of uh, nonlinear function composed with BI times X. Um, so that's a that's a rich family that represents the deviation from the identity. And as the network gets deeper, the message of the of the result is that that nonlinear part can get flatter and flatter. Okay, and. Uh, I have a formal statement of, you know, the conditions that we need. We want our H to be differentiable and invertible and smooth, so it's got a bounded slope, and um, uh, the inverse function is, also has a bounded slope, and there's another technical condition, and under these conditions, I'm skating over the, the details, you know, the message is really on the previous slide. Under these conditions, we can represent such a function exactly as a composition of, of M uh, vector-valued functions. Um, and uh, all of those uh, get closer and closer to the identity as the depth gets larger. So being close to the identity is, is not a uh, restriction if we're wanting to represent a function uh, that satisfies these, these conditions. Okay, so um, the analog, so this is the analog of the, of the, the linear result, the first linear result of, of um, um, Moritz Hart and Tengi Ma, uh, and the analog of the the optimization result here is, um, uh, is, is as follows. So the kind of criterion we're working with is, uh, again, uh, the expected squared Euclidean norm of our prediction error. So we've got some function h, and we're trying to use that to predict uh, an a outcome variable y, a vector. And our criterion q here is telling us um, uh, how accurately we're predicting it. Um, the minimizer, of course, is the conditional expectation of that vector y given x. So we're assuming that there's some fixed joint distribution on these xy pairs. Not, you know, with, we, we don't need to assume a linear relation, uh, uh, any particular relationship between, between x and y. Um, the minimizer is this conditional expectation. Um, we could think about uh, the distribution as being an empirical one, so we could be talking about um, error on a training sample. Um, we have a function that we're, we're going to represent our function as a composition of m functions. Uh, and we're going to insist that each one of those functions in the composition is close to the identity in this, in this uh, sense that it has a small, small slope. And then the result is um, that the gradient with respect to any one of these, so functional gradient of our criterion Q with respect to any one of the functions in this composition uh, is large um, whenever the, the um, criterion is above the optimal value. So Q of H star is the optimal value, right? The conditional expectation is the best we can do in terms of minimizing this, this squared error. Uh, and, and so Q of H minus Q of H star here is the is the excess uh, of, of our criterion. When that's large, we must have a large gradient in some direction. So there must be some way to improve uh, on our performance uh, by, by moving HI in function space in some direction. Okay, so the message is that we can only be at a flat spot if uh, Q of H is, is equal to Q of H star. Again, first order condition for optimality tells us that we're, we actually have the, the conditional expectation. So we're working in function space here, right? These are Frechet derivatives, uh, and we're talking about you know, induced norms um, uh, for uh, a particular norm on the, on the input space. Okay, so um, 
The theorem tells us that if we have a suboptimal composition and each one of the functions in the composition is a near identity, then there's somewhere to go in function space to improve on our performance. Um, uh, there's some downhill direction. Uh, so every stationary point in the sense of functional gradients is a, is a global optimum. You don't have local minima or, or saddle points in, in this sort of setup. Okay? It doesn't say that if you fix a particular parameterization of those nonlinear functions in the composition, for instance, you know, think about networks with a fixed width and ReLU nonlinearities, that you won't come across uh, local minima or saddle points. And actually, you, know, you should. You should expect those for a fixed parameterization, but it tells us that unless we're at the global minimum, there is a downhill direction in function space, and it may be that that direction, that, that every direction we can move in, in uh, our parameterized class of functions is orthogonal to that, but certainly there's a direction in function space that could take us uh, downhill and improve the, the criterion unless we're at the, uh, the global optimum. Okay, um, you know, one consequence of that is that, that um, suboptimal stationary points uh, uh, aren't arising because of interactions between parameters in different layers, they're arising only because of the restriction of our parameterization within a layer. That's one way to think about it. Okay, so um, that's the, the second part of that result, that, that if we're uh, away from the, the optimum, then there's always a downhill direction to go in, in, um, uh, in function space for, for every one of our uh, functions in the composition. Okay, so I'm going to skip over there a bunch of open questions. This, you know, I think I think um, uh, very interesting uh, directions um, uh, that that follow on from this. But you know, the big question is, okay, if we know this this property of of uh, stationary points being globally optimal, then you know that suggests, pr provided that we have all of our HIs uh, close to the um, close close to the identity, then it suggests that you know a gradient method. Uh, working in, in in function space should be um, uh, should be a reasonable approach to to try, and that motivates the second part of the talk, where rather than working with gradient methods in these rich non-parametric families, we're looking at uh, just the linear case. So you know, scaling back our ambitions, we're not advocating the use of compositions of linear functions. Rather, looking at when we work with uh, this particular parameterization of a linear function, does a simple-minded method like gradient descent um, uh, work in, in the sense of finding one of these stationary points that we know satisfy these nice conditions? Um, OK, so this part of the talk is joint with uh, Dave Helmbold and, and Phil Long. So as I say, we're working with deep linear residual networks, so we're thinking of those as products of matrices that I've uh, denoted uh, theta sub i. So we take our input vector x, we multiply it by this first matrix theta 1, and so on all the way through L layers uh, to produce our, our um, output, which is f sub theta of x, uh, vector valued output. Uh, and think of each of these theta i's as being close to, the, close to the identity. So this is the class of functions that we're working with. Of course, it's just linear functions from rd to rd. Um, but parameterized in this uh, kind of bizarre way. We make the assumption that there's a, a joint probability distribution on xy pairs that models you know, the process generating our x's and the relationship between x's and y's. And we're considering using a gradient method to choose the parameters, uh, you know, this, this um, uh, set of, of parameters. So theta denotes theta 1 through theta L. Uh, so as to minimize a loss function that, it, again, we're just going to consider the expected squared Euclidean norm of the difference between our prediction f theta of x and the outcome y. OK, so we're going to make a few assumptions to make our life easier. The first one is that the, um, so I guess we need these moments to be, to be defined, but um, we're going to assume that the that the um, second moment is, is the identity. Uh, I guess we're assuming that the x's have mean 0. Um, um, you know, this is without loss of generality. This is just a rescaling to, to um, uh, save on a whole lot of notation. The other assumption looks like it's a, it's a strong one, that the y is a linear function of the x uh, for, for some least squares matrix uh, phi. This is actually no assumption at all. It's true without loss of generality because we can decompose the, our, our error into you know, the least squares, um, re replace y with the least squares um, term phi of x plus 
the difference between y and phi of x. Right? And that second term has nothing to do with theta, so a gradient method is uninfluenced by the second term, and, and the second term is orthogonal to everything else. So you know, we really don't lose anything by thinking about the loss as um, defined with respect to a new y, which is this phi times x. Uh, so, so you know, this is this is convenient because you know now we know the optimal value of the loss is zero, right? Okay, so when we work with um, with these two assumptions, the gradient descent here, you know, uh, we're we're using some notation, uh, kind of MATLABish notation that uh, theta, I guess not. These are products, right? Theta sub i to j is the product going from, you know, the ith layer to the jth layer, uh, and uh, we're going to start off with identity initialization everywhere and then, and then use gradient descent. So this is back propagation. Um, so we're taking the theta i after t, t steps and we're shifting it, uh, uh, taking a step with step size uh, eta in this gradient direction and you can you know, explicitly compute the gradient in, in this way. Right? It's the product coming from the input to this point, it's the product coming from the output to this point, and then, and then the gradient, gradient signal. Um, OK, so we have a few results here. The first is that if, if the initialization is good enough, so remember, we're starting off with the identity everywhere. So if the identity function is good enough in the sense of having this squared error less than some specific constant, uh, um, uh, universal constant, then um, you know, small enough step sizes, enough iterations, we get, we converge exponentially fast to the, the, the right thing, the least squares um, uh, value. Okay, so that's reassuring, not so surprising. It's like saying, you know, we're, we're in a, locally in a, in a kind of convex situation, a smooth convex situation. Okay, so um, uh, a little more generally, we might ask, you know, what if we're, we're not uh, already very close to the to the optimum. Um, so the the kind of key feature here seems to be a positivity sort of condition on the least squares map. So um, you know we say a matrix is positive if when you feed a vector into that matrix you get another vector that has a positive inner product with it. All right. So and and you know we quantify that with this gamma positivity um, uh, definition. Uh, so we want to we want to make sure that. Uh, so for a gamma positive linear transformation, we're taking any vector and getting a, a, a nice positive inner product out from, uh, from the, the linear function. Okay, so the first result is about symmetric least squares maps. Okay, so this is a map from RD to RD. It's the linear map that minimizes the squared error. Okay, so it's the thing that we're shooting for, the best possible relationship between x's and y's. And we're making, initially, making this assumption that that map is symmetric. And you know, I see a bunch of frowns. Yeah, this is a bizarre assumption. Okay? So, but let's go with it for a moment. It turns out, in this case, we can characterize when, when gradient descent's going to work. If the least squares map is, is symmetric, then um, you know, for sufficiently small step size, we get exponential convergence to the optimum. Okay, so gradient descent is going to take us to the, the least squares map. Uh, provided that that least squares map satisfies this positivity condition. Um, and conversely, if the least squares map doesn't satisfy this positivity, positivity condition, so if it has a direction in which you're mapping a, a vector to something that has a negative inner product with that vector, then uh, you, you're in trouble. Gradient descent is never going to get you to the, the least squares solution. And you know, this is a, a really rather easy theorem to prove. The symmetric case means everything decomposes, and the, and the symmetry of gradient descent means everything decomposes into one dimensional, a one-dimensional kind of analysis of a um, you know, rather, rather nasty nonlinear evolution. But, but you, know, you, can, you can analyze it and show that positive least squares maps Everything works nicely. Uh, negative least squares maps, you're never going to get there. Okay, so this positivity condition uh, is is exactly the right thing uh, uh, in the case of a symmetric least squares map. Um, so it turns out, oh, and 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 the negative result extends actually to all sorts of um, uh, regularization uh, schemes uh, on top of uh, uh, vanilla gradient descent. <laughs> 
Okay, so it turns out that the positivity condition, although we don't have a characterization in the general case when we move away from this admittedly bizarre symmetric uh, assumption, the positivity condition suffices. So if we have a least squares map that has, satisfies this positivity condition, then gradient descent uh, will, get us, will get us there fast. Uh, I'm sorry, not gradient descent. There's a specific algorithm um, that will get us there fast that's based on gradient descent, a projection, and a, and a sort of regularization. Um, we call that the power projection algorithm. I mean, I'll tell you quickly, we take a gradient step, we then project onto the set of positive matrices, uh, and then we do some sort of uh, spreading out of this, of this map, to, so do a balanced uh, kind of factorization. So the scale of all of the, the mappings at each layer is, is uh, the same scale in some sense. And uh, I'll skip over the details of that. OK, so to summarize this part of the talk, um, uh, gradient descent um, uh, works if uh, we start out sufficiently close to the least squares map. Um, it works if the least squares map is symmetric uh, and satisfies this positivity condition, and conversely doesn't work if it doesn't satisfy this positivity condition. Uh, and we can introduce this kind of regularized, balanced version of gradient descent that does, that does work under the positivity condition and without the symmetry condition. OK, so um, the convergence is, is uh, linear in all cases. So we approach the, the minimal value of our loss exponentially quickly. Um, so that's great. Of course, this is you know, rather a kind of contrived conditions. We're talking about uh, gradient descent with an identity initialization. So we're, we're getting the exact gradients at every step. You know, what happens if, instead of an identity initialization, we start out with some random initialization close to an identity? What happens if we use stochastic gradient methods? You know, all these things are not so clear. I guess in the case of random initialization, um, there's some very recent work of uh, Ohad Shamir looking at um, uh, that, that case for the scalar functions, so the width that each, uh, so we're mapping from R to R. Uh, so we, our, our parameters here are just, uh, just scalars at each step. And in that case, it turns out, you know, you get this, this sort of degradation um, uh, there as well, that, that you get an exponential slowdown uh, with, the, with the depth of the network uh, if you don't have the, the positivity condition. Um, Okay, and of course, you know, the very interesting um, uh, direction here is understanding the analogous kinds of um, uh, properties of these sorts of algorithms for the nonlinear case. And, uh, uh, you know, I think that's really a, a, an important direction. Okay, so the, the third part of the talk is uh, completely switching gears, looking at statistical kinds of questions, generalization questions in these, these deep networks. Um, and you know this this sort of analysis, understanding generalization properties of classes of functions that we use in in uh, prediction problems, you know, is, has a has a long and rich history. Um, the the um, there, there's this very classical theory due to Vapnik and Chervinenkis. Um, we we start with probabilistic assumptions. I guess we're going to simplify things and think about for a few slides. Think about the case where we make predictions that are just plus or minus one valued. Right, so we've got um, a cl binary classification problem, and if we're thinking about a deep network, then think about having a single real output, and we're thresholding at about zero. Um, we imagine that the data is generated by some probability distribution on this product space of inputs and, and these labels, plus and minus one. Uh, and the aim is to choose some function from a class of functions, maybe the things that a deep network can represent, so that the probability of misclassification is small. Okay, so we're formulating this problem as, you know, we have IID training data and we'd like to um, minimize the misclassification probability under the same joint distribution of, of pattern label pairs. Okay, so there's this result from, from the uh, 1971, the paper appeared due to Vapnik and Chervinenkis that says, fix a class of functions um, for any probability distribution that represents the process generating this, this data. We have a training sample of size n, so n xy pairs, x1, y1 through xn, yn. With high probability over the, over the training data, every function in our class has misclassification probability close to 
the proportion of training examples that are misclassified and the measure of closeness, this deviation term, depends on the sample size n and it depends on the complexity of the class f through this combinatorial dimension, the, the VC dimension. Okay, so, you know, this gives a bound. Um, uh, these bounds uh, have a reputation of, for being loose, but in fact, um, you know, it's a, if, if you want a uniform bound that's true for all probability distributions and you want to make a statement that's true uh, of this kind, that's true for every function in a class, then in fact the only thing that can be improved in this expression is that constant C. Okay, so, you know, it's a, it's a tight inequality. Um, and this seems to be bad news for neural networks. The VC dimension for neural networks increases with the number of parameters. Depends also on the nonlinearity and the depth. Um, let me skip over some of these results. I mean, there are a bunch of results about the impact of different nonlinearities, the impact of the depth on, on the VC dimension. A uh, whole lot of work over a long period of time. Um, I guess the the one high-level point to take from this is with this sort of a result, when, when the right notion of complexity, when, when you're working uniformly across probability distributions, the right notion of complexity is the VC dimension, and for neural networks, it increases with P, the number of parameters. Okay? So that sort of result seems to be inconsistent with practice, with, with what's observed in, in practice, um, in the sense that, you know, networks are routinely trained with a number of parameters that's one or two orders of magnitude bigger than the sample size. All right, so a deviation term that scales like VC dimension over sample size to some power is, um, uh, is, a, is a fatal kind of a thing in, in this analysis. Okay, so this assumption that we need to work with all probability distributions, this, this uh, formulation of the problem saying we want to work with all probability distributions is being uh, much too conservative. So there's a whole line of analysis um, looking at um, uh, relaxing that assumption where we, we're not so concerned with the very fine-grained features of our class of functions, which the VC dimension focuses on, and we're, we're exploiting the fact that perhaps we're working with a real-valued class of functions and minimizing a nice smooth criterion like quadratic loss or cross-entropy loss, and so those fine-grained features aren't so important. So this is the, the margins analysis. This part of the talk, I, I mean, margins analysis dates back a, a long way, 20 20 plus years. This part of the talk is, um, is uh, much more recent. This is joint work with uh, Dylan Foster, who's a PhD student at Cornell, and Matus Telgarski, who's a professor at uh, Illinois. Um, and this is looking at uh, applying those sort of analysis ideas to, to deep networks with uh, uh, Lipschitz nonlinearities like um, uh, ramp, ramp functions, like uh, ReLUs. Okay, so um, the idea of a, a large margin analysis is to uh, look at the, to, to exploit the fact that we're really, really using the real valued um, uh, functions uh, in, the, in these problems. So we've got, again, a vector valued function. Maybe this is a multi class classification problem. We have M outputs and M class labels, and we use the outputs to decide on our predictions. The, the output with the largest value um, uh, corresponds to a prediction of that class. We define the, the margin for an xy pair as by how much the correct output, the, the output corresponding to the correct label, exceeds the next largest, uh, exceeds the max of all of the other outputs. Okay, so this quantity might be negative if we're misclassifying, right? But it, it's positive if we're classifying and bigger, you can interpret a bigger value as being a, a more uh, confident uh, correct classification. So that's, that's the definition of this margin, margin quantity in the, in the multi-class case. Um, and, and, you know, simple observation, if we're working with losses like uh, quadratic or, or cross-entropy, then, uh, you know, we're not just trying to get f of x uh, to be just over the threshold. We're really encouraging large, large margins in some sense. And, and as I say, you expect the fine-grained details to be less important. Okay, so... Um, uh, what emerges is where, in, in, in this work, we're measuring the this complexity of the functions that we work with uh, via operator norms, via bounds on by how much you can blow up a vector as you move through the network, right? So we consider the operator norm in, in going through one layer of the network. Um, uh, and, you know, there are some other um, uh, nice wrinkles about the multi-class case that I, I won't mention. Okay, so this is the notation. An operator norm is, 
uh, how much you can take a unit norm vector and, and blow it up by passing it through a matrix, and we're assuming that the nonlinearities um, are uh, Lipschitz functions, which is um, uh, the case for, for sigmoids, for, for relus, for max pooling uh, operations, and so on. So many of the typical um, operations. Okay, and the theorem says that with high probability over the training data, every um, uh, parameterized function in our class, where f sub a means we've got these parameters a, uh, I guess I'm switching notation, these parameters a that appear linearly, so we take a matrix a, we take our input vector x, multiply it through a, then pass it through some nonlinearity, and, and, and so on, all the way through this network. Um, every function of that kind has, so this is in terms of the margin on, on uh, uh, a random xy pair. So just think of, th this is saying if the margin is negative, you know, of course that means a misclassification. So the probability of a misclassification is bounded by some measure of performance on the training data. This is the proportion of training examples that have a, a margin less than some positive number gamma, uh, plus a penalty term that depends on, well, the sample size n appears there, right? The depth l appears, and the ratio R over gamma appears. So gamma is this margin, and R is the, uh, the scale of, think of it as the scale of functions, the complexity of functions that we're computing, as measured by this product of operator norms. Right? So as a vector moves through this network, it, it could get scaled up by as much as this operator norm of the, of the AI. And we're taking the product of those. So this is saying how much can we blow up a, an input vector as we move through these L layers. Um, so that's the quantity R in there, and, and you know, this appears uh, in this deviation term. So critical thing is this ratio of R over, R over gamma. Uh, and there's a little fudge factor that I'm just going to skate over. Okay, so very quickly, you know, one nice property of these, of these results is that some dramatic generalization failures seem to be, um, uh, you know, at least consistent with the, the, the qualitative form of, of these, uh, these bounds. So um, there's been this, this uh, very nice work studying sim simple, um, uh, so the CIFAR 10 data set, it's, a, it's an image classification data set. There's this nice work um, by um, Chi Yuan Zhang and a, a bunch of other folks uh, last year looking at what happens when you take the CIFAR 10 data set and just randomly permute the labels, right? So, so the blue curve is, is showing training error as uh, training proceeds for the actual CIFAR 10 uh, data. The red curve is showing what happens when you randomly permute the labels. You can still get the training error to zero. Okay, um, so if we look at, and, and of course, you know, that's rather striking, right? In the, in the one case, we get a pretty good performance in, the, in the, the case of the blue curve. In the red case of the red curve, you know, we know we, we can't do any better than tossing a coin. All right, and so, you know, the deviation between training error and, and test error is, is very different in those two cases. So what if we look at the margin distributions in those cases? Well, they're really very similar. Okay, this is a distribution of the margins on the training data. Not too much to distinguish them. But in fact, if we look at the ratio, the thing that appears in that deviation term, the ratio between the margins and the scale parameter, this product of operator norms, there's a huge difference between the margin distributions. All right, so uh, similar thing on MNIST data. This is a, a cumulative distribution. Huge difference between the, the random labels um, uh, and the true digit labels, the, the scaled margins in that case. Okay, um, so when we look at, you know, actually the, the relevant complexity term as training proceeds on, um, in this case, the, the uh, green curve is the, is the true labels, the blue curve is the random labels, and this is showing that product of operator norms, how it progresses uh, throughout training. We see a, a very big difference, and if we plot the excess uh, risk, so test minus training error, uh, here on the same scale, we get something that you know seems to seems to correspond. Um, okay, so you know that's kind of satisfying. We get something that looks qualitatively consistent with the with the theorem. Um, you can ex re refine these bounds to residual networks. Bunch of recent work looking at um, more fine-grained properties of of the networks. Uh, of course, you know I think a very interesting direction is understanding um, how this how this could match up with with uh, optimization methods, um, you know, how we might explicitly control statistical complexity of these networks. 
uh, for, for some sort of generalization. Um, but you know, I, I mean, this is not the, the full story. There are, there are very nice examples actually where this sort of um, qualitative agreement between the, the behavior of these uh, scaled margins and, and the generalization behavior um, seems to break down. So you know, we don't, we don't have the, the full story yet. So all right, I'll stop there. Thank you. So people from the audience, uh, if you have questions, please go to the two mics uh, that are in over there. So can we interpret uh, deep neural networks as kind of kernel functions? We are trying to learn some sort of kernel machines, similar to Gaussian processes, kind of. Right. So um, one of the attractive properties of kernel machines is that you have uh, a nonlinear uh, you have a linear parameterization. You know the nonlinearity is appearing in the in the definition of the inner product. Um, uh, so you know I think the the um, interpretation that's consistent with kernel machines is you know we really should be thinking of these methods as as non-parametric methods. You know so we're working with rich families of functions, and I think that's you know the viewpoint particularly that I um, uh, advocated for at the start of the talk is we should be thinking about these these uh, functions as compositions of rich nonlinear functions from rich non-parametric families. You know, I, I, I don't think there's anything particularly precious about uh, ReLU parameterizations or uh, you know, these because, various other sorts uh, from that perspective. Yeah, because kernel machines, uh, kernel-based techniques are also very resistant to noise. And the uh, uh, example you showed where you are uh, permuting the labels that is also kind of resistance. Yeah, and and you know it's consistent with the way that these methods are used in practice. You know, the typically the uh, number of parameters uh, is is growing with with the um, the sample size. So you, you know you have more and more data. You keep the number of parameters at you know typically a, a couple of orders of magnitude bigger than that, right? So this is this is a characteristic of a non-parametric method. More questions? Let's thank uh, Peter again for a great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>